Thank you for coming all the way down. Thank you for having me. Liverpool uh, to Power Talk. It's really good to have you here. We just want to introduce yourself, explain who you are, what you do. Yeah, great. of course. Uh, thank you for inviting me at firstly. Um, I'm Grace, I'm from Edgehill University and I'm researching um, for a PhD. I'm in my last year now. Um, so the research is based around gangs, counter lines and child criminal exploitation. Um, as well as the research, I've been lecturing criminology for three years. Um, so that's also gone hand in hand. And um, the research, I've been researching in this area for about four years now. And it started when I was based in a youth offending team. And that was in Merseyside. And the practitioners, you know, they were growing quite concerned about the number of young people that were coming into the criminal justice system um, for drug offences, for weapon offences. And they were basically saying, well, you know, why is a 14 year old from Merseyside being picked up in Scotland for possession with intent to supply Class A drugs? You know, how are they getting access to that area? How are they making their way there? Um, and as well, how are 14, 15 year old young lads um, getting access to guns and them guns then being picked up by the police in, in the homes and things like that? So um, it was really sort of, they were throwing around the idea of child criminal exploitation. And when I started to do research into it, there was actually there was no academic literature into it. There was no um, media reporting on it. There was no government reports on it or anything. Um, the same with county lines, really. So um, over the past 18 months, it's blown up, as you know. Um, county lines has become a hot topic. It's now um, on the national agenda <coughs> for, um, for the government. So it's very timely research and I've been very lucky that actually there's been the the need for it as well which has helped quite a lot yeah wow um you said some words there which I'm familiar with but it might be good just for our audience so uh, uh <coughs> child criminal exploitation yes. and county lines you just want to break down what those things are okay. in the best way you can so I'll start with county lines yeah. so county lines um to put it in the most simplest form is where drug dealers from a major major city will travel to an, a different location that might be a rural area or a market town and they'll basically infiltrate a drug market that isn't very strong they'll set up a base there and then they will continue to sell class a drugs such as heroin and crack cocaine um, that's the most simplest version of it yeah. where child criminal exploitation comes in and that's basically just the use of a child for economic gain and it's exploiting their physical and um, emotional immaturity, basically. So where that comes in is through um, these drug dealers will try to mitigate risk against themselves um, and they'll send young people from their hometown to these areas. Now, um, dependent upon the relationship that the young person has got with the drug dealer and dependent upon um, their level of sophistication, largely um, influences where the young person is based. <clears throat> so, usually they are based in the home of a vulnerable drug user, and that is a process known as cuckooing. Cuckooing. Uh, okay. Um, termed by the police because they've taken over somebody's home, basically oh, like, like a nest see. formation. Right, okay. <clears throat> um, so, some young people will be sent to the home of a vulnerable drug user. Right. Some young people, if they haven't got that relationship or the level of respect or sophistication, will actually just be sent to work from the streets. Um, from sleeping bag or something like that. So um, the length of time that the young person spends in that location varies from about three weeks to about six weeks. They might be tasked with bringing the money back or the drug dealer will travel to that location numerous times, give them more drugs and take the money back um, at the same time. So um, it's just, it's, it's a very, very good profitable scheme for drug dealers because they are based in the major city still, they're based in their hometown, and it's the young people based in the area that they take all the risk for very little profit. So um, I think they, they'll be paid between 50 and 100 pounds a week for being there, and it's, it's a 24 hour job, seven days a week. So whenever the phone rings, they'll have to go. So living conditions, are, you know, like, they're not like in a hotel and it's all kind of nice. No. It's like, okay. They're in very, very poor hygienic um, properties, half furnished they'll have um if they're lucky they'll be able to sleep on a mattress on the floor or they'll have a sofa which they'll just use um as and when they need a lot of them say that they sleep in the clothes <coughs> to 
to make it easier to get up and wow. and go out and, and do those drug transactions if they need to. Um, they won't have access to showers a lot of the time. Um, but working living conditions are, are awful. They're, they're surrounded by crack cocaine use, um, drug paraphernalia, um, you know, normalised heroin use. They're surrounded by it on a daily basis and violence as well. Wow. Is this something... I mean, obviously, you've just broken it down in a way which an average tabloid newspaper wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, how are these young people um, kind of groomed or brought into county lines? How, what is the kind of common denominators that we um, you've seen in your research, really? For me, I mean, they will always say it's for financial reasons, but for me... I would say it's sense of belonging and it's it's young people that have got something missing from the home environment or from you know life in general they haven't got the skills to be successful in the legitimate drug, uh, legitimate mm. employment market um so they feel like the only way that they can succeed is by selling drugs or you know participating in criminality yeah. but essentially it's that sense of belonging and then you know these drug dealers they'll come along and they'll say um you know, stick with us and they'll give them that bit of status and significance and, you know, all young people want to be is recognised for something. Yeah. Um, so whether that's something negative or positive isn't really of, hmm. of concern. And where are they concern. going to, like, you know, where, where are they actually going to pick up these kids? Uh, the drug dealers. Yeah. The, the most... Uh, people refer to units, generally. Well, I'm Sorry, come back Peter, to that. Yeah. No, 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 I'm going to come back to that because that's, that's interesting that you, you started there, but go on. Um, so children that have been excluded from yeah. mainstream school is absolutely massive. So I spoke to 18 young people in my research and 18 of them had been excluded from mainstream school. So they were and either... All 18 be- were, in, in effect, came part of county lines? Or... No, only five of them, but oh. I'll come on to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, all of them were in... Um, alternate education providers or in people referral units or not in anything, just, you know, left their own devices, access to youth offending teams. Wow. So that, I mean, it's something which keeps coming up every time I interview somebody around um, violence, uh, exploitation of young people, exclusions and what goes on around schools and people referral units is a consistent conversation. Um, do you see that as being the primary problem or breeding ground? Yeah, I do, yeah. Because not that every excluded young person is going to get into drugs or, or youth crime, but the opportunities there, you know, and if they've, got, they've not got the skills, they've not got the friends are in school maybe, they're going to want to associate with like-minded young people that are in the same boat as them. And there's a huge pool of them. But why, but why people with L units? I mean... Let me just be naive for a moment and just be like, well, you know, it's, um, it's an education provision. Um, why would that be such a hotbed of activity for uh, drug dealers, gangsters, who, whatever you want to call it, gang members to then go there and try and exploit young people? Why there? Because you've got, um, you've got a large number of young people with behavioural issues that have all been excluded from school and they're all in the same boat, you know, yeah. easily led, wanting that level of respect, wanting that status, mm. um, with not, not very good future prospects. Wow, yeah. Um, I don't know whether it's the fact that they actually go to those people referral, it's people referral units to find these young people, but the young people that end up mm. working county lines have been excluded from school. And the truth is, in, you know, one of the arguments I've always had is that when you've got people referral units, the timetable is different from yeah. like normal school. So it's always a bit odd. I always find it odd when they come out maybe at one o'clock or something. So well, what are they going to be doing between one and three o'clock when uh, children in mainstream education and then come out? And that has always been a bit of a problem for me that you've got the typical children who are struggling the most in life. You put them all together. Yeah. And you put them all out, and you also give them more space and more time, and a lot of that does turn into criminality. Tell me a little bit more about your research, because you said, obviously, you've interviewed 18. Yes, yes. So what were you trying to ascertain from, from that research? What is it, what is ultimately, 
you know, not all of them ended up turning into county lines, but what was what was going on? So the, the research actually started just looking at child criminal exploitation right. and county lines has grown from that because it's, it's a massive aspect of that. Sure. Of the 18 young people that I spoke to, now they were from youth offending teams, people referral units or alternate education providers. It's not quite a people referral unit, but it's, you know, it's supposed to be sort of similar. And yeah. again, they have um, restricted hours in, in those units. Um, of the 18, only five had experience of working the county lines. The others had been exploited into inborough drug, drug dealing. So just, you know, drug dealing for somebody in their area or the neighbourhood. Um, I actually found it, where my difficulty lies in what the media reports is. I found dif uh, dif stark differences between the, the young people that are exploited into working the lines and the young people exploited into working in their own neighbourhoods. So the young people that were working county lines, they were much more mature, they were much more resilient, and they were quite charismatic. You know, they had something about them. Yeah. Um, I didn't find force at all with these five young people, and that's why I find it difficult. Interesting. And I'm not saying that, that, that there is no force involved, of course there is, and probably in areas like London, definitely. But in Merseyside itself, the young people that were working the lines, they had to have a level of respect between the drug dealer and the young person. They'd all, um, they'd all sold drugs for quite a period of time before, so the drug dealer knew that they were competent enough to get the jobs done without detection. So there was no force. I mean, the young people were definitely exploited. They were working for somebody else. They were getting paid absolutely nothing. And... Um, you know, they, they thought it was good, but they weren't, you know, if you broke it down to them, they're getting less than minimum wage per hour. Yeah. Now, the ones that were exploited into inborough drug dealing in their own neighbourhood, there was force there, certainly. Right. Um, they were much more mature, both physically and emotionally, right. and really quite naive. What was the age range? Between the youngest person that I came across, anecdotally, was seven. Seven? Seven. Now, he was just passing things through the school gates, passing little quantities of drugs. The, the youngest person in my actual research was 14, so 14 to 18 and beyond. Wow. I'm not yeah. easily shocked with that. Yeah. I mean, the, they won't like to advertise that it's less than 10 years old. No. Because it raises many issues. But within primary schools, I think it's on the rise, definitely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And again, obviously we're talking from like a Merseyside context, which is good because, you know, if you just look at the press, it's all about London and there's yeah. nothing that's going on. So this is really helpful to get a more of a national picture. Uh, what was the kind of race demographic in the 18 people you... 17 were white and one was mixed race and he was from London. He was based in St. Helens. He yeah. moved for his own safety. So we can you know, without fail, say that this issue of um, criminality around drugs, violence, isn't just a black certainly issue. Certainly not. Certainly not a race issue. No, certainly not wow. just a black issue. That's incredible. <clears throat> well, it's not surprising to me, but that's what's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, and so if we, you know, race, we can park to, to an extent. Um, in terms of their level of kind of poverty? Was there poverty in the mix and...? Yeah, yeah, they were all from um, quite deprived backgrounds. Right. Um, from Heighton and Knowsley. Now, Knowsley was of the most deprived nationally, I think, in 2017. Right. Um, they're from Sefton, Knowsley and Liverpool, and the areas that they're from in those boroughs are very, very deprived. Yeah. Or they're coming from um, single parent families or actually in care. Yeah. And it's those kind of like, um, yeah, that kind of common denominators such as care and, and poverty and exclusions and stuff, is which I, I really wish we focused more on than just kind of like parking. Although part of the problem I have uh, coming in from a London perspective is that, you know, I think 25% of uh, the people who were... Uh, unfortunately lost their lives to youth violence or violence in, in London, it was a 
increase in those being black. Yeah. So I'm always kind of, I always struggle, is this a black issue? I don't think it is, as you've just proven it across it the not. UK. But I do think in some areas where there's high hyper-diversity, um, such as London, it does impact, it tends to disproportionately impact black people. So my thing is that there's always this tension that we've got to hold when we're looking at a London uh, issue, but beyond that, and we all know that Glasgow had the highest rate of the highest murder rate in uh, 2005. But again, Scotland's quite a, a white exactly. area as well. Exactly. So, so it just I goes mean, to show, doesn't it? It's not. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of similarities between Liverpool gangs and, and gangs in Scotland in, what way? in terms of demographic. Yeah. Um, the backgrounds that they come from and you know the heritage as well. Yeah. So I think. It really does just mirror the demographic of that area. Yeah, it's, sure. It's not an, an issue of just, just black or white. No. And that's good. And what do you think of, we hear terms like the public health approach. Um, what do you think of that? Maybe break it down for us. What is that something which we, you're a fan of or, you know? Yeah, I think youth violence needs to be a public health issue, certainly. Um, it needs to start with early, early intervention and prevention, certainly yeah. from... When the child's, you know, I've just mentioned seven-year-olds being exploited. Yes. It needs to start when the child's right before primary school and the education needs to come in primary school so that they've got a really good grounding yeah. of, you know, what would happen if they went down that road or what would happen if they went down that road. Yeah. Um, because I think by the time they get to high school, which is where a lot of the education has been so far, not to cast them aside, but it it's largely a little bit too late because they're already at that age where they're seeking that respect and status from, from other people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, early education and prevention. There needs to be some sort of research or, you know, something around school exclusion because okay. the link is there completely, 100%. You know, all the young people in my research had been excluded. Yeah. Um, instead of making them go through to sit the GCSEs when they know they're probably not going to get good grades or they might get excluded before they get there, you know, yeah. take them out and give them give them some skills that they're actually interested in. Because the young people that I spoke to in my research, they're so intelligent, just in a different way. Yes. Yeah, they'll say things, and I'm like, wow, but really we, interesting. And it, because it blows my mind that part of the reason why Scotland uh, did so well, Glasgow in particular, around this public health approach was that it had zero exclusions, which we don't have in England and Wales. So I, I always find it odd when we start talking public health and we're going to uh, have and trauma informed and all these words which we use. But one of the key things around the public health approach was the zero exclusions. You know, as I've said previously, one person was permanently excluded in the whole of Scotland last year. Do you think that saying we're going to do public health, a public health approach, by ignoring the zero exclusions part of it? Do you think that means that this public health approach is not really going to work, or do we, or can you see it? Yeah, I think it's all smoke and mirrors without addressing right. the school exclusion, really, because okay. it's all well and good, you know, having the police there and having education and health there. But if you've got a young person that's on the streets from nine till five or all day long because they're not in school, mm. what are they going to do? And there's no youth clubs, largely been closed in Merseyside. There's really nothing for the young people to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So unless you're addressing, you know, the lack of activity and the lack of yeah. opportunity to, su to succeed in mainstream society, then... And is the issue, you know, in London, we talk about austerity uh, being part of the cause. We, some people would say race dis disproportionality. Others would say, you know, the police, lack of cuts with the police. Um, is this the type of same stuff you would see in Merseyside, which is part of the reasons why this kind of collective, or is there other things which are more cultural, which you'd... Um, cannabis use, cannabis consumption right. is absolutely huge, which hasn't been mentioned yet. Yeah. The, the young people, the ones that I spoke to in the alternate education providers would turn up having already consumed cannabis that morning because it was the first thing that they'd do. Right. Um, a lot of the ways into being criminally exploited is through buying cannabis and okay. the drug dealers will will essentially give them sort of a loan, you know, it's a buy now and pay later scheme if they haven't got the money. Knowing that they haven't got the money and knowing that they won't have the money in three weeks' time. Sure. So then they'll come knocking in three weeks' time and um, then the only alternative is, oh, well, you'll have to deal drugs for me to make that money back. Right. So cannabis consumption is huge and it's normalised in Merseyside. 
uh, you know, you can walk down the street and you'll smell it and no one wow. thinks anything of it. Yeah. So what's the solution? I mean, some people say legalise it. Yeah, legalisation and regulation as well. Okay. Definitely. But my question with that is, will it just lead people to harder drugs? And cannabis is one thing. Skunk is what, in my experience, and I've worked for mental health charities and stuff, uh, particularly around youth violence, the impact of skunk yeah. on, the, on, on the psyche and just mental health, it's, it's probably the thing I've seen more than anything else just alter a young person's mind more than anything I've ever witnessed. Mm. So when we say legalising cannabis, that doesn't necessarily uh, talk about the other stuff which is a bit more toxic or no, a lot more toxic. So is that, I'm, I'm kind of just playing devil's advocate a little bit, but is that really the answer? I don't know. I don't know. I've not found cannabis to be a gateway to other drugs. Sure. I've found cannabis to be a gateway to criminality. Okay. And it's sort of, it's not been talked about much. You know, this link between cannabis use and criminal exploitation and then working the county lines. That's, they're all smoking cannabis, either to, to get money, to deal with the emotions that they otherwise can't deal with, hmm. um, or as a way of socialising with their friends because everybody does it. That's fascinating. You mentioned that you worked for a youth offending service before you were doing... I was doing research there. You were doing I was, research I there, yeah. Do you think that uh, those workers um, and any other, I suppose, professionals working particularly with young people, do, they, do you think they feel equipped? Do you think they feel kind of, you know, what's the case load like? What, how, do they feel like they're going into a situation with uh, the necessary tools to No, be not, at all. not at all. So um, the, the youth offending team that I was based in recently has gone through um, cuts to the staff and the services, so they've been cut by half. So all the staff had to reapply for jobs, and they've basically cut half of those jobs. Wow. Now, they were already um, stretched before that happened. The, the practitioners that I spoke to, they'll say, we just want to spend time with the young person. And because of the targets that are now on them as well, they've got to do um, admin, increased admin, writing reports and stuff. And that takes away the time that they can spend with that young person. Mm. And even things like, um, you know, community work or community service where they'll take the young person out, they haven't got the staff to take that person out wow. or to, to safeguard. So there's no activity outside of the youth defending team like there used to be as well. Yeah. So, you know... They'll, I mean, they'll, they'll say it themselves. They're, they're sitting in a room with a young person with a worksheet ticking, ticking a box. And the staff are fantastic, but it's, yeah. they, they acknowledge that that's not going not gonna to help most young people. And um, I don't know what it was like for like, the, the staff you were working with, but I know when I was working for Youth Friend Service in 2006, between 2006 and 2010, the idea of clinical supervision was a myth. Now, I'm hoping you're about to say that all the people you were connected with were getting clinical supervision or some type of support. Was that the case? Was there much going on from what you're aware of? It is very limited. Yeah. And what support was there was probably made up for 5% of the young person's week. Wow. So you've got another 95% where they're, they're on the street fending for themselves. And how much, how much effect are you going to have on a young person when you're only with them for a very small yeah. amount of time? Sure. When you've got other influences such as drug dealers or mm. other adult yeah. offenders telling them that this is the way or... But in terms of the staff, were they getting much clinical supervision or...? Um, I'm not too sure on that one. Yeah. I'm not too sure on that one. Um, I'm not sure. It's really helpful just to, I think, the way you've just explained what's going on with um, County Lions. Uh, and just actually, just one other thing, just um, this uh, modern slavery yeah. act. Do you want to just explain a little bit what that's about and how that has, for, for better or for worse, impacting practice around uh, particularly young people going, getting involved in county lines and going missing? Just what, what is this Modern Slavery Act and what...? So the Modern Slavery Act is basically where you know, anyone can be um, prosecuted if they aid or organise the movement of a young person or any person from one area to another. Um, I think... The difficulty with, with modern slavery is that typically you would associate that to somebody working in a cornfield and they would have their hands cut off if they didn't do the job. The problem that we've got is the level of coercion that the young people are subject to. They don't understand that they're a victim. 
they don't see that at all. So trying to get them to stand up, well, trying to get them to stand up and say, you know, this person's exploited me would be one thing because they don't want to grasp on anybody anyway. But the other thing is that they don't recognise it because a lot of the time the relationships, um, for example, one of the young people that I spoke to, he'd been welcomed into the Trubzilla's home, to his family, he babysat sometimes for him. You know, the relationship was very, it was kind of reciprocal, but there was still that element of exploitation there and obviously modern slavery. And I don't know if the current legislation addresses it correctly because it's not looking at that level of coercion that's going on right below the surface. Yeah, that's, um, that's really helpful. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to comment on or say? Or? Yeah, I think for me, for me, one of the most interesting findings of my research, and it's very controversial, and it's the reason why I struggle a lot with what the media are reporting, is that the, the five young people that were working the county lines actually adopted the role of exploiter themselves. Now they would exploit the drug user of which, the home that they're staying in. They'd exploit them to complete drug transactions with other drug users in the area because it looks, it looks less um, suspicious if the police were to see, you know, a drug user and a drug user rather than a young person and a drug user. They would um, use them for entertainment purposes to pass time between transactions if they're bored, you know, they'd, they'd make them do challenges for fun and they'd give them a, a bit of free drugs to secure that compliance. And as well, they'd use the females for sexual purposes. Um, so I think that's an area that needs a, a lot more work because common discourse is just saying, well, we've got this young person, he's innocent, he's been exploited, he's been forced against his will. And the young people that I spoke to, it's not the case at all. Um, they'd got a lot more agency than, than was being made out in media. Yeah. So victim becomes perpetrator. The, the, the line between victim and perpetrator is, is so blurred. And yes. I think they're always going to be a victim. Yes. But at what point do they stop being a victim and you know, take on that role of perpetrator a little bit more? Oh, yeah. It's a very, very difficult one. The power dynamics just shift. Yeah. And they enjoy that power. They enjoy that ability to, to exert control over somebody. Yeah. Because the way that they, they speak in the interviews, it's sort of like it's giving them energy and they're quite excited about what they've made somebody else do. Yeah. And it must be something, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but there's obviously clearly something about parts of the brain which uh, get more aroused and there's more excitement, especially in adolescence as you're growing. Um, so that all, you know, it's not a surprise when no. you start seeing this type of stuff play itself out. Yeah. And a lot of the, the young people, they would morally disengage, so they'll, they'll come up with tactics to sort of minimise their own, their own blame. So these drug users that they're exploiting themselves, they completely dehumanise them. They'll say they're, they're scumbags, they think they're horrible, they'll call them fens and, um, you know, they think, they, they think that they're less than human. And that's how they let themselves take on that role of exploiter. Wow. Well, I mean, I've learned more than I anticipated. <laughs> it's like so much going oh, on. Guys. It's guys. really, really helpful. Thank you for your time. Thank you um, for the amount of research that you're putting into it, you know. You're going to be doing some training for us as well, which is, is amazing. Uh, so other people can learn about you um, and what you're doing. But yeah, keep going. Um, I'm really glad that we can collaborate and that we can continue to put your work out there as well. So um, yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much.